welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. I'm set I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and glad you're joining me again today. This is episode 113, February 3rd, 2019. And today we're going to talk about building your own organic garden oasis with a uh, guest, Jackie Beyer of the Organic Gardener Podcast. And we'll get into that here in a minute. But before we do, let's talk about a few homestead updates. Well, we survived the polar vortex. And so did all the animals. Actually, they did pretty good. You know, I don't have a bunch of animals right now. We just have a few rabbits and a few quail. And they all did really well. I mean, I don't have them in a heated room, but they are out of the wind and, you know, dry. And, and uh, you know, just a little more trouble keeping them uh, watered. Uh, just things freezing up a lot faster. But, you know, it, it did all right. They did really, really good. They seemed like they were thriving, actually. No no problems whatsoever. So we got through that. It got down. The wind chills got down like minus 30-something. I mean, it was really cold. It was, uh, I think, minus 13 uh, was the regular temperature, and then wind chills in the minus 30s. So plenty cold enough to have some trouble, but we got through it. I, well, I did have a little trouble. Uh I'm going to be buying a new pump for my aquaponics tank come spring because uh, the heater I had in there evidently quit working and the entire thing just froze solid. So the uh, pump, I'm sure, fried. I pl- unplugged everything, but I'm sure it uh, it busted it probably. So I'll be getting a new pump for that come spring, but no big deal. You know, things happen. I just I wasn't keeping a very good eye on it. And I, I know it just didn't overpower the pump, the uh, the heater, uh, because I also have one in my pond, and you know it's it's there's no ice on on that pond at all, and uh, so they're working. You know it's working good. Um, it keeps things thawed out when it's working, and it just uh, you know the the one in the the aquaponics tank just didn't make it, and uh, that that will happen, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, that's gonna cost me a little bit of money, but no big deal. Um, oh, I I cooked rabbit yesterday for dinner. And uh, I cooked it a little different than I normally do. I want to tell you about it. It came out really, really tender, really good. And I cooked it in a pressure cooker. Uh, well, actually, I have one of them carry electric pressure canners. And it's a you know cooker slash canner. And um, I cooked it in that. Man, it was good. Uh, I just threw the whole rabbit in there. I parted it up and I threw it in there. And I put in, I chopped up an onion and pretty big chunks and, and put it in there. Um, threw some sweet potato in there, pretty big chunks of sweet potato, some carrots, some whole carrots and um a little bit of a uh, uh, chicken stock that i had uh, canned and probably about a pint of that and man did that come out great i put it in there for about 20 minutes uh, and uh, just so tender so good and i just thought well i'm gonna share that because i thought that was a really good way to cook it i, I mean one of the drawbacks of, of cooking rabbits sometimes if especially if you fry it uh, you know or cook it fast in, in some ways it, it it's a little tough it can be a little tougher than chicken, um, a little more fibrous than, than bird. So, you know, rabbit, it tastes a lot like chicken, but has a little bit tougher of a meat if you don't cook it right. So I thought I'd just throw it in there and try that. And it came out just better than I think it's ever been before. So if you're looking to cook some rabbit, try it in your pressure cooker. Uh, some people say like 10 minutes. I thought 20 was really good. The, the vegetables were probably a little bit softer than I like them. So maybe 15 good balance. Cause I really wanted it to just fall off the bone. So I went 20, 15 might do a good job though. Uh, but I hear, I see a lot of recipes out there just calling for 10 minutes in a pressure cooker. That seems a little, uh, too, uh, short for me but uh 20 worked really good 15 might work good but came out really great oh and i finally got my big berkey water filtration system I had a little bit of trouble uh, with my order on that and it seemed like it, it ended up taking me what about three weeks i think to get it so i was a little upset especially when the website said uh next day shipping <laughs> <laughs> I said either same day or next day shipping, and yeah, three weeks later I finally got it. So I, I took a couple emails back and forth, and uh, me not being very happy, and and you know the I think the person that was selling it to me wasn't very happy that I was being a little um, 
up front with them on some things, but you know, I finally got it. No problems. Um, but yeah, I love it. I, I've been using, I used it, uh, hooked it all up yesterday, got it installed. You know, I was kind of dreading priming those filters. I've, I've kind of heard people talk like it was hard, but it took me about 20 seconds of filter. I had the, I have the two black Berkey filters and I also have the two, um, uh, fluoride filters, the PF2 filters. And, uh, I just heard people talk about how they thought they were hard to prime, but all four of them, I primed with no trouble whatsoever. Like maybe said maybe 20, 30 seconds of filter, um, priming them. And then they, I popped them in and everything's working perfect. seems like it's working great. And, um, I think we're going to get a lot of years of really good use out of that thing. So, uh, I think it'd be worth having. So if you don't have a big Berkey or a great water filtration system, you might look into getting one. There isn't much that's more important than a good clean water. So, uh, we've, we've had other methods of cleaning water and we've bought a lot of water, uh, cause I just don't like drinking municipal water and we're on a municipal water supply and I just don't drink it. We don't cook in it or drink it. So we're always, you know, either buying water or filtering it in some other way. We've had other filtering systems in the past. We even had our hands on a big Berkey at one point. Uh, we were borrowing from somebody, but they needed it back. They were moving and we had it for a while. So, um, but yeah, they're, they're great. I mean, they are great. Oh, and I finally have an office slash podcast studio again. My, uh, my daughter and her, uh, her son were staying here. My grandson, uh, had to stay here for a while. They were, you know, they, they were signed up on a lease on an apartment that lease came to an end. She didn't want to sign another lease. So she was gonna have to get another apartment. She didn't want to live there anymore. So she moved in here for a couple months while she was, um, uh, looking for an apartment, another house to move into. And uh, she ended up being here a little longer than two months. I think she was here about five months. So she was here for a while, but she finally got her a house and we got her all moved in and I got everything back moved into, into that room that used to be my podcast studio. So kind of out of the living room. Now I'd had everything on a desk in the living room and that wasn't ideal for podcasting and blogging and everything. When you got, you know, the grandkids come over and visit and be running around and, you know, or, or even my grandson living here for a while, he'd get pretty loud sometimes. So I didn't have a place to really do it. And I think it, it's what caused me to not get as many, um, podcasts out there for a short time there. I wasn't putting out quite as much because it was just so hard to get a quiet time in the house. I was having to get up at two thirty three in the morning just to get a little quiet time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got up, got everything moved back in there. I don't really have it all straightened up and set back up real nice yet, but it's functioning and everything's working. So, uh, it's great to have that back. Um, well, that's kind of what's going on around here. Uh, let's just jump into our main topic with, uh, with Jackie Byer. Jackie grew up on Long Island, about 20 miles from New York city. And in fourth grade, she uh, read a book about a girl who moves to Northwest Montana. And then from that day on, she was determined to move there. And at 21, she entered the University of Montana. And then during her junior year, she met her husband, Mike, on a mountainside. And they've been together for for 24 years now. And uh, Mike, he's the gardener, uh, her husband. And uh, he's been gardening in the Rocky Mountains for 40-something years. And uh, got Jackie really interested in that lifestyle. Jackie launched the Organic Gardener podcast in uh, January of 2015. And she's interviewed over 260 gardeners and food experts. So she's uh, she's been doing this a while. She's talked to a lot of people. And she'll even, you'll hear in her confess that she's not the gardener in the family her husband is. But she's developed quite a love for it. You know, you, you and we talk about that too, how it's just contagious. And, you know, you're just bound to, to develop a real love for it when you're around it all the time. You're talking to people about it all the time. And she really has. And um, she has a lot to offer on today's podcast. And we're going to talk about building your own organic garden oasis. So a really good topic, uh, something I'm kind of passionate about as well. And uh, you'll get to hear about what she, uh, what she has going on and her journey and uh, some of the projects she has right now for you and her podcast. So let's just jump right into that interview. I know you'll enjoy it. Jackie Byer, welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Well, thanks so much, Harold, for having me here. And just, hi, listeners. I'm just thrilled to be a guest on this great show. Well, it's uh, great having you. And uh, I'm excited to hear all about all the things you're doing. And I would, you know, I guess I just want to start off by wondering, how did Jackie get to where she's at right now, hosting the Organic Gardener podcast and doing all the things she's doing? I mean, how did this all start? Where Let's go back a few years and, you know, maybe meeting your husband and working up, you know, to, to this podcast. Sure. Well, you know, my husband and I have like a, um, a really romantic the way 
way we met because we actually met on a mountainside and we got in like this huge fight the very first like time we were talking to each other <laughs> um, because I was like this passionate environmentalist and was like, we should never cut down another tree again. And he was like, you environmentalists, you always think that, um, you know, we can't just like not cut down any trees. You know, there's bugs that get in the forest. There's pine beetles that have killed lots of places like you have to keep a healthy forest. You know, like he's not into clear cutting either on the flip side as a logger and a sawyer for years. So, but we were working for the Forest Service on this tree planting contract. And so it was just really funny, but it was pretty much, uh, we've been together ever since. And that was back in 1991. Mm. Um, we got married in 1993. And then we, when we very first got married, we didn't have running water for the first six years or power or anything. Um, and we're on 20 acres in Northwest Montana. Um, and then once, in like 2000, 1999, 2000, we put in power and dug like a shallow well, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago in 2014, I think we put in a deep well that's 560 feet deep. And wow. so, um, I've been, um, I'm a teacher by trade. I'm an elementary educator and just, uh, started listening to podcasting and in 2014 or well, 2014, I joined like a podcasting group and in 2015, I launched. So it'll be like I was saying two weeks on, or it'll be four years on Tuesday, January 29th. So I don't know when this will be released. We're talking just a couple on Sunday, the 27th. So it'll be four years. And it took me a long time to figure out how to get the recording software down. So <laughs> anyway, but the interesting thing is like, even though my podcast is called the Organic Gardener Podcast, I'm more the organic eater and my <laughs> husband's really the gardener although since i've done my podcast and i'm up to episode like 260 so i've interviewed a lot of people like i have definitely spent more time in the garden in the last four years learned a ton like i used to say i have a brown thumb i could barely keep like a basil plant or a geranium <laughs> alive but now i'm pretty confident i can grow i've grown lettuce and plants flowers and Last year, I grew my first cover crop and just like he grows what I call like the mini farm, which is like, I don't know, between a quarter of an acre and a third of an acre. Mm -hmm. Like his goal is to grow all as much of our produce and food like potatoes, carrots, like anything that we can store as we can to supplement our produce bill, you know, our yeah. grocery bill. Um, but I'm more into like flowers and spending time in the garden. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so, I mean that's it's a and it's contagious. And the more you're around it, and the more you hear about it, and now you're even talking about it, I'm sure you've just developed a love for it. You know, getting out there and working in the garden and being part of that. Yeah, well, I am so inspired. I mean, my show's a success because of my amazing guests, which I hope you're going to be one soon. I think we have a date to talk yeah, in yeah. February scheduled. To that. Um, it's just people sharing their knowledge and their inspiration. And I call my audience green future growers because like, um, I feel like it's more than just growing vegetables. It's like you're creating a whole earth friendly environment, you know, like a, a space where birds are happy and, and people are happy. And it's just like, it's more than just like a production farm. It's like a place that you can live and enjoy mm -hmm. and nature, you know, we're not using any, well, there's a lot more to growing organically than just not using pesticides or chemicals on your right. garden. I've certainly learned, and it's more like creating a whole ecosystem. So yes. that's what I love about it. Well, before we go down that path too much more, and I definitely want to, I want to back up to something you said a few minutes ago. You said you lived a few years without any running water. <laughs> We did, and I could definitely give some tips about that. So, like, yeah, the let's number talk about one that a little bit. Yeah. most important thing, I think, to living without water. Well, all right, there's a couple. But one is, like, we hauled water for a long time. And if I was going to ever do it again, I would – but I would I would give it all up. I don't care. The power, the electric, you can figure all those things out. But I would not live on a piece of property that didn't at least have like a well that I could go outside and like pump the water. Yeah. Where um, was you getting the water from? Anywhere we could. Like, just harvesting neighbors, rainwater and churches, like, oh. you know, public <laughs> water places, like anywhere we could, like somebody would fill up our five gallon buckets. Like, oh, wow. Just, yeah, it was. And eventually we bought a 1500 gallon water truck for watering like the lawn and for doing laundry and washing dishes, but it wasn't potable. So we still had to haul our drinking water. And of course you can't use a 
water truck in the winter in Montana um, because it would freeze. And even like when we dug our shallow well, we would use that water truck to like gravity feed the garden, but we were still really limited to what we could do. That sounded like that was a real challenge. (laughs) But if you have at least water, like this is another thing like that's huge that when I moved into the house, my husband already had the drain set up. So like, you know, doing dishes in the kitchen sink, I had to haul the water in, but I never had to haul dirty water out. We could take showers, the bathroom, you know, you had to pour water over your head, but never had a problem. So like that would be my number one thing. Like at least if you have water on your property, but you don't have water in your house hooked up or, you know. You should have drains, like insist on drains. It's too huge. Hauling dirty water out is just, you don't want to have to do it if you don't have to. Yeah, and you should be able to hook your yeah. drains up. Um, you know, a lot of gray water can go on your garden. I mean, mm-hmm. it kind of depends. I think there's some places that have regulations about it, but a lot of places, um, which your gray water is like water that doesn't have, uh, maybe if you have like environmentally friendly soap, maybe like from right. your kitchen sink going down into, uh, out into the lawn. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of systems, filtering systems, the natural filtering filtering systems that people build that filters out even the gray water to, to even make it more pure uh, to use on the garden. Um, you know, they just, they'll they'll put you know it's like a box. You'll run pipes through, drain pipes through, and it'll it, you know filter with sand and soil and plants and things like that to even filter that water out further. I've seen some pretty neat setups for things like that. Yeah. So, and technology has made so many things so much easier and just it's come so far, like solar panels alone. Like if we could have, mm. uh, part of the reason we put electricity in was our neighbors did it and they dropped the price from like $10,000 to $2,000. And so you let them flip the brain. major part of the bill. <laughs> yeah. So it was just, you. I mean, up until then it had been pretty prohibitive where we were. And, then and how long did you go without true. electricity and water? Uh, well, it just kind of like it all came together at the same time. So we, I don't know, I've been here since 91 and we put the power in the, uh, summer of 99, I think going into 2000 by the time the whole house was hooked up. And so that's like another tip I would give people like, even like, cause I was going to school that fall, um, in Kalispell, which is like the nearest town to us, which is like 65 miles away. Right. And so they were building and they're working on it. And it's like every day I would have to get things. But like the day my husband was like, okay, you have to go get the parts for the shower. Like I should have been so ready for that. I should have known exactly what I wanted. I should have like done all the research. I should have known how expensive, like, cause yeah. we really wanted to put this cast iron bathtub in and then it was really hard to find the parts, the inlet, the outlet, the attachments. And I made the mistake of thinking like, I don't know, somehow I like miscalculated and I wasn't like counting in the cost of having to buy a different tub and like some of these. And so it would have actually probably been cheaper, if not the same cost to use this really nice old cast iron tub that my husband had, like we already had the tub. We just needed all the parts and that's what we had been using. That's what had been in my house with the drain hooked up to it. And so then I ended up getting this like other tub without, you know, that was like less expensive, but in it, and then we had really cheap, um, what are those things called? Like, you know, the thing that turns the shower head on and the, that actually like, you know, the spigot that comes out of the tub, like all those yeah. parts were like really inexpensive, like not well-made ones. So like if I would tell anybody, like if you're building your house, even if you don't think you're going to get running water for like two years, do that research. Know what you want because the day your husband finally says, go get it, you want to be ready. I mean, granted, you know, this was what 99, like we had just, and it's so funny because like we flipped into the 21st century, like cell phones, computers, right, satellite, right. like all overnight, like, you know, people like barely had cell phones back then. And so and now you could even just jump on Amazon and have that stuff at your door in a couple of days if you needed to. Yeah. Quick. It's so different, but still like doing the research is just like, I would be ready. Like that's one thing I wish I would have done way more research and been like ready for that yeah, question. You, you than thought you'd have been thinking a lot about that <laughs> i know just i just i don't know i just i could just was like oh i'm gonna go to the store and be like i have a cough of bathtub you know what do i buy and it never occurred to me that like they weren't gonna have it at the hardware store and i don't know anyway 
Well, yeah, it sounds like you, uh, that would, that would be a tough way to, to get started and do things, especially for as long as you did it. And there's a lot of people that that's just the lifestyle they love. I mean, they, they wouldn't even want to put those things in. I mean, some people would say, I don't even want an indoor toilet. You know, I want that outside. <laughs> well, no, I'm totally there. Like yeah. we still have an outhouse. We still use our outhouse. Like even though the indoor plumbing works, like I love my outhouse, <laughs> but I know people laugh at me and I'm like, I don't know. Once you have an outhouse, the thought of going to the bathroom in the side kind of right. grosses you out. Yeah. But, yeah, I kinda understand but running that. water, like having a shower, being able to do laundry and being able to wash dishes in the kitchen to me, I don't know. I like that part. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. Well, let's, let's get back to the gardening side of things. Now okay. you've, you've interviewed how many guests on I'm, your show? I think I'm up to 260 or right 260 around there. 260 guests. And, uh, so you've probably learned quite a bit about, about gardening, even cause you say you're, yourself, you what, you're not the gardener necessarily. You had the, you know, the brown thumb and, and, uh, so you probably learned and a lot from some of your guests. My husband still does 90% of the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm sure you've learned a lot. What's some, what's some good advice you've gotten from some of your guests? Uh, well, definitely the number one theme throughout my whole show has been, um, healthy soil, just Mm. making your soil as nutritious, keeping a healthy environment. Like a big question people talk about are pests and diseases, but then the number one solution everybody comes up with is the healthier you can have your plants be in the beginning, the healthier your soil is. Um, water is a new, uh, a huge one, like being able to water your plants enough, they're going to be healthy enough that they're going to resist disease and resist pests. Um, another surprising one is like having like a sacrificial plant. And this like actually mm-hmm. like came in. Um, so I, did I talk about like Mike has this like little mini farm and, and so he grew more broccolis than we'd ever been ready to grow, which is like my favorite food. And I was like, please grow me broccolis. And, one plant completely got like it almost looked like it was moving it was so infested with aphids and i was just like what is this and it was just completely covered in them but none of the other plants got it and so we just left that one plant yeah, there still growing with all the, and i can't believe i didn't take a picture of it but then none of the bugs really got on any of the other plants and so um and that's kind of like the whole idea of the oasis is like if you're if you're growing for the most part, I've had very few people come on and talk about like on the rare occasion they have to wipe out a whole crop because they got some pest or bug in there. But mm-hmm. for the most part, you might have to sacrifice some plants or maybe like you're not going to have cabbages one year, but you are going to have like your lettuce is going to grow and your spinach is going to grow and your kale is going to grow. Like most things are going to do really well. Uh, I have heard some people that have real have had really hard trouble with moles and mice and and critters like that getting mm-hmm. into their gardens. But definitely healthy soil is like the number one key. People have said to having like you know the um, biggest resistance to um, pests and diseases coming in, and then also like it brings in beneficial insects. And and so that's another one. Like um, I interviewed this woman Anastasia Kolpakeus who. Uh, runs this place called the farm on the roof, which is like the, one of the biggest, um, farms on roofs in the world. It's in Brooklyn. And I went up there, um, last summer when I was visiting my family and took pictures. And like, my mom was so amazed that they had like this whole perimeter around their farm was just this gorgeous, like foot wide path of herbs and beneficial flower or flowers that brought in like beneficial insects. Yeah lace wings and assassin beetles and um praying mantises and and bees and pollinators and and bringing in those flat like having those flowers and bringing in those insects gets rid of a lot of the pests so that was another part of um thing i've learned and then cover crops would be like probably the third biggest thing that we really are kind of getting new but like even if you're just a backyard gardener like one small bed you can still fill in cover crops really well and that's like a way to grow your soil by adding nutrients mm-hmm. to it yeah i would probably uh, head that direction on many of those topics myself you know the soil is really important uh, companion planting and mm-hmm. uh, yeah cover crops i mean it's something we do here a lot in all three areas and so yeah i think that's great advice and i can see that being a, a common uh, theme for most gardeners because it's just it doesn't take you very long uh, when you're gardening to realize how important healthy soil is. I mean, it's just, it is the key to your garden and having healthy plants. And, but I like what you said about the, uh, the sacrificial plant. You know, I've noticed that and a lot of folks would rip that plant out 
and all oh, that's just infested. Let's get rid of that. And when right. you do that, they're just going to move on to the next plant <laughs> and uh, maybe to all your plants if you, if they, if you get them away from that one. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great piece of advice. Really. I know. I just like, I had, had guests talk about it, but I had never really seen it until that one year. And I was like, wow, look at that. That's mm-hmm. just amazing. And yeah, it didn't really, but they didn't bother like the other broccolis. I, the problem we have with the broccolis that year were the squirrels. Like we have a huge deer fence because oh. in Montana, you've got to have a deer fence. Um, but the squirrels, you know, when the chipmunks would run along the top of the fence and they could get in and out of the garden, they would just chew on my broccoli and they would take like two bites and then move on to the next one. And two bites wow. and move on to the next one. And it's just, just that. enough so you couldn't it's enjoy it. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can see that being uh, pretty disappointing. Um, well, let's talk about this this garden oasis thing. You mentioned it a couple times. Um, what do you mean exactly when you're talking about that? Uh, well, so to me, what I've been talking about is like a place that produces food, but also is like some place that you really want to hang out. Some place that like another big theme that really I hadn't thought about until I started my podcast was. Places that your kids are learning to crawl, kids are toddlers are running around, kids are playing soccer, um, lawns where your dogs and cats are running and they, they generally have smaller bodies and they're just more susceptible to chemicals and weed killers mm-hmm. and sprays that you're going to put in your lawn. So having, um, an earth friendly lawn and landscape, a place that's, so it's not just about growing an organic vegetable garden and getting the most produce. I mean, we certainly talk about effective practices and being efficient and strategic and different things you can do to get more food for the amount of space, you know, getting the most amount of food out of the space because gardening is a lot of work. And if you're, and if you're going to do all that work, you want, you know, you want to have successful results, but also like creating a place that's, um, you know, really cares about the environment really like is a good place for humans to be. Um, but also like, you know, encourages like, snakes and frogs and turtles to live there and and um you know different wildlife that comes in the butterflies like i said and the bees and the pollinators and just mm-hmm. um where you have like a whole ecosystem built up around your place and it's some place that like i don't know i get to spend a lot of time hanging out in our garden because um even if i am working full time when i come home at the end of the day and make Mike makes it a really nice place to stay. It's like when we have visitors, that's our favorite place for people to come. When the grandkids come, they love to hang out there and just, I really feel like it's, it's helping you create a place that, um, you know, is a place that you want to enjoy. Mike's made so many paths through our places and little mm, walkways yeah. that make it more than just, um, a place where you're just going to grow to grow food. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, and I, those same practices I try to, 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 to carry out here you know have a productive garden have a garden that's that's healthy and safe have a garden that's environmentally environmentally friendly but you know have a place that kind of feeds your soul as well you know that you can go out there and you just feel at home and you can walk around and you just feel good about it you know and it just you feel like this is where i want to hang out i mean there's days i say i'm going out to work in the garden but i'm really not working in the garden i'm grabbing a lawn chair and just sitting out there in the garden you know what i mean because it just it just kind of does something to you it makes you feel good and because you're working hard and you're out in your truck and just, yeah, you should have a place to come back to at the end of the day that you like to enjoy. And just, I don't know, to me, that's my favorite part. I like to paint a lot. Like my all time dream is to be a children's book illustrator. And mm-hmm. I like to sit in the garden and relax and do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that being a perfect place for that. But yeah, I just, I, I agree that uh, having a, you know, having a place is just beautiful. It's so important. And I think, a lot of homesteaders, especially, um, they, they kind of get wrapped up on the, the production side of it. You know, it's like, we just want a productive garden. We want to be able to feed our family. And it's just this one, you know, kind of aim to, to, to do that. And that's, that's great. That's a great goal to have. But if you can, if you can build a place that's beautiful and, and, and comfortable and, you know, just, uh, just a place you really want to spend time too. I just think that there's, it's an important part of gardening, I think. And I think there's a lot of things that can make a big difference. Like when, when we didn't have running water, we would go to the lake like every single day of the summer. I'm not exaggerating. Like we were, and now I find we never go to the lake, but it does get really hot in places in the afternoon, like finding a really nice shady spot to sit, mm-hmm. um, sometimes because a lot of gardens need, you know, full sun. So, um, another thing that can make it like not the nicest place is mosquitoes. And so, um, 
you know, planning yarrow around your perimeter can help kind of eliminate that. And then just other different things that you can do to make it a bit of a nicer place to hang out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let's kind of back up a little bit and, and I would like to know why organic gardening is so important for you. I mean, uh, you obviously care a lot about the environment and, you know, the, the insect, the bees and butterflies and birds and all that. I mean, is it, is, is that what it's all about for you? Do you just see the, how harmful, uh, the other ways of gardening are that you want to just kind of, um, do organic gardening to kind of counter against that? Or is there a bigger reason? Well, you know, that's a really good question. And it's not like we're certified organic or anything. I mean, I talk a lot about earth friendly practices and natural practices, but just, um, you know, and I certainly when I go shopping at the store, I, I can barely afford to buy organic food. So that's like a big part of it is like I said, I'm really the organic eater. Like mm-hmm. I like to eat really healthy nutrient. I'm not even sure I knew. I, I still remember like asking somebody like, what does nutrient dense mean? You know, but growing nutrient dense val- vegetable, like you don't realize like, um, how important it is that the food that you have is actually nutritious. Like a lot of processed food doesn't, you know, the nutrients and the longer it between the date that you harvest something and you actually eat it, like, a lot of vegetables are losing their nutrients and you mm-hmm. want something that's getting all that healthy soil and the food from the soil grown up into the plant. And so um, for me, eat it. it's it's really a lot about uh, eating the food, you know, having the food that I want to put in my body available. Right. Like I don't want to be eating food that's grown with bunches of pesticides in it. You know, a lot of food that you get in the store is grown for um you know, for transport, for the time it takes to get for storage, for like mm-hmm. how long, how, how it's going to look when somebody buys it in the store, you know, three weeks or months after it's been harvested. And so being able to grow food that's still full of like the vit, you know, that you can get the most vitamins out of, that you can get the most minerals out of, that you can get the most nutrition out of, that I can put into my body to stay healthy. I guess is really where a lot of it comes from. And yeah. like, truth be told, I had never heard of like no till or permaculture until I started my podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was kind of a learning process for me too. I just, I was the same way. I just wanted to eat healthy. You know, I, uh, you know, I had cancer and, you know, it, uh, at one point, yeah, and, you know, I was trying to, you know, just get healthy again. And, and I, you know, eating, eating good food right from my backyard seemed like the best way to do that. So it was the number one reason, but I also, you know, because, I like all those practices as well. You know, I don't want to help the environment. All those kind of things just kind of come along with it for me. But yeah, the number one reason for me as well was eating healthy. Yeah, because that's important today. And I think people don't realize how lack, like the lack of nutrition and also just like there's a huge thing in taste. Like if you taste a homegrown strawberry and you taste a strawberry you get at the store, they're so different. And oh. then. Like my, I talk about a lot on my show, people are surprised, but like, I don't even put tomatoes on my salad most of the winter, like Mike pickles beets. And to Mm -hmm. me, that's a great place to get antioxidants. And like, it's got a lot of the same things that a red vegetable has. And so just trying to eat more locally, trying to reduce our carbon footprint, but also like trying to get things that are, um, in our invite, you know, that grow here, you know, beets grow really well in Montana, tomatoes, not so much. Well, you know, I love tomatoes, but them store-bought tomatoes, they're just not the same. <laughs> yeah. And so just, um, slowly, like I said, Mike's goal has always been to try to grow as much of our food as he can. And so yeah. it you, tastes you, great and it's more nutritious for us. And I think, uh, I think that really helps. Do you uh, preserve a lot of food as well? I mean, you can and, and things like that. My cans like carrots and green beans and beets mm-hmm. and pickles and um he bakes a lot of our bread. I don't really can and we don't we would love to get a chest freezer. We really yeah. want to build a root cellar. Um but just you know, you always have goals over the years and yeah. just yeah. the fact that we dug a well was huge, so <laughs> well, it sounds like you're doing great. You're making making a lot of steps and I'm sure in no time you'll have all those <laughs> things as well. So uh yeah, well sounds like you've really developed a passion for for this kind of gardening and 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 your garden uh your organic oasis and and all that but what what kind of things uh are you doing right now as far as i mean we, of course your podcast you got a popular podcast that's doing great what other things you're working on 
Well, for my podcast, I've been working on this. Um, it's going to be called free. It's freegardencourse.com and mm-hmm. just, and then hopefully there's going to be a workbook with it. If people are interested in like a hard copy, that's got like, cause I made a lot of check, you know, since I'm an elementary educator, like, you know, so I've made a bunch of quizzes to go with it and like yeah. checklists and just different things to kind of help walk people through it. And then because, you know, I mean, it's kind of like my podcast. I mean, we're just passionate about teaching other people and helping people because my husband and I are both very passionate about, you know, saving our planet and trying to like yeah. make sure there's still a planet for our grandkids in the future. So, right. you know, just getting that information out there and helping people see that they can be successful too. And that's exactly how I feel about it as well too. You know, I want to pass on the information. Uh, you know, I just find that like for me, I'm actually an urban uh, homesteader. You know, we, I know I saw your pictures and, in the yeah, in and place. I'm trying to do a lot here and it's, but because I didn't have a lot of acreage and a lot of room, you know, it, for years I didn't, I thought, well, I really can't do that much, so why do anything at all? And so I have this passion to just, like, get people to do something right where they're at. So I love that you're putting out this course because I think it will inspire a lot of folks to just start gardening, even if they have just a little bit of land or maybe even just a place to set some pots or whatever, and just get started with doing some good, healthy gardening and and feeding themselves a little bit better and, 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 you know, being a little kinder to the planet and all that. So, yeah, I mean, as a grandfather, father myself you know i i want to see things get better for my grandchildren not worse you know yeah well and i think like one of the show things that makes my show a success is kind of like my curiosity and like the fact that i'm not the expert because i i make a better listener and i ask questions that i think Mm -hmm. my listeners and like you were saying like newer gardeners like in my book a lot of the things i've written is like if you've never gardened before like if i was starting without mike like, these are the things that I would do. These are the steps that I would take. Like, these are the, like, I would just start, like, with, like, lettuce, peas, and carrots, I think, yeah. my first year. You know, like, yeah. I, because those are easy to grow, and they pretty much, like, are cooler weather crops. Because I right. think one of the hardest things for me is, like, remembering to water. Like, I even planted these herb seeds, like, a, some basil, and I don't know what else is garden. Like, Mike's laughing, and he's like, what'd you plant? I'm like, I don't know. Did I label them? No. And then he's always like, you didn't water them today. You have to water them. Like, I forget to water things. And so a lot of what I put in there is, like, simple steps that I would do if I was starting from scratch. And so I yeah, think that kind of helps people a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, it sounds like you do have a passion for it. You developed a real passion for it, and I think a lot of folks can really benefit uh, from what you got going on there and your podcast is great. I, you have some great guests on and you ask great questions. So I hope folks will, will go check that out, but you want to just uh, drop some information about all that where they can check out your, uh, your website, your podcast oh, sure. and anything else you have going on. Yeah. Thanks Harold. So my po- my website is just organic gardener podcast.com all spelled out and you can get all the information from there. And if you want to sign up for a free garden course, I, we started it last year when I came home over Christmas vacation. Like, I don't know how some suddenly all of a sudden all the 12 chapters and the table contents and I've been working on it for a year and I am hoping it's going to like official, like the relaunch is going to be on Tuesday, January 29th. But mm-hmm. if it'll really get there, I don't know. But, uh, you can sign up and see what's been done so far. And Well, it sounds great. I, I think uh, folks should definitely head over and check it out, and I'll put those links in the uh, the show notes for folks to, to check out. And uh, I'm sure they'll uh, head on over and uh, give your podcast a listen because uh, if they're not, they're, they're, they're missing out. <laughs> like I said, you have some great guests on. You, have, you do a great job. Well, thanks. And I do have great guests. And if any of your listeners ever have any questions about, you know, homesteading or living without running water or getting started, you know, don't hesitate to email me. I mean, I'm on Facebook or on Instagram and or just, you know, you can there's like a contact page on the website somewhere. I don't think people have a hard time finding me. You have a you have a pretty good uh, Facebook group, too, it looks like. Uh, yeah. So I would I don't get to spend as much time in it as I would like, but I'm I'm getting better and just uh there's people from all around the world in there it's amazing they kind of actually certainly lots of things get shared in there so mm-hmm. it is a it's a it's just amazing i just feel blessed to be a podcast host i think it's the best way to meet your peeps and make friends like you and just um 
you know, talk to people and learn. It things. is a lot of fun. I wish I had more time to do more of them, but uh, it is a lot of fun and I enjoy it a lot. And, and uh, I, like I said, I enjoy listening to podcasts. I have a lot of time through the day as I'm driving to, to listen to a lot of shows. So I really appreciate uh, folks like you and others that, uh, you know, are faithful about yeah. putting the show out and, and, you know, giving us some, some things to learn and uh, even having some entertainment. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, it's not all just about learning. It's just fun to listen to, to folks and hear what they've got going on as well. Yeah. Well, I love biography, so I just always fascinated. Yeah. And I think like you do that. It's, um, it's just great to listen. I'm, I appreciate you seeing that. Cause I always feel bad. Like I used to put out a show every Monday and Thursday and I feel like only putting out a show once a week. Isn't that much anymore. <laughs> well, if I could get one out every week all the time, I'd feel pretty good. But I, every once in a while, I don't even get them out weekly. So I completely understand. It's really, it's, it's like a part-time job, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Oh, it's huge. The amount of work I spend on my podcast is just huge. Huge, but yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see how it goes. So well, it sounds like it's going really well. You've been doing it a long time, and uh, I look forward to um, hopefully many more years of uh, listening to your podcast. Well, thanks so much for letting me share with your audience. Yeah, it was great. Have a great day. All right, you too, Harold. Well, there it was, folks. A uh, great interview with Jackie. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Jackie. I'm looking forward to being on her podcast. I'm going on her podcast next week. I don't know when it'll air, but I'm, I'm being interviewed on her podcast next week, so I'm looking forward to that. And I'll have links to her website and her free organic garden course in the show notes. So head on over to the show notes. You can find those at smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 113 this is episode 113 and uh, i just some really good stuff there and i know you'll enjoy your podcast so go check that out also want to tell you and just remind you uh about the homestead forum membership community you like this podcast you like what we're doing you want to support it and you want to get some extra stuff too join the homestead forum membership community you can learn more about the benefits of membership by by uh, going to smalltownhomestead.com and clicking on become a member there in the uh, menu or you can just head on over to the homesteadforum.com and that takes you over there as well but uh, it, we just got a lot of great stuff going on there we do have a forum of course it's a forum i mean you can get in there and interact with other homesteaders and um you know, we have extra podcasts in there. We have videos in there. We have discounts to all kinds of products in there. So you want to check that out. It's really, really worth what it costs to be a member and you get to support this, uh, this show. I sure do appreciate you joining me on today's podcast. It was a lot of fun. I, I you know, I got a lot of interviews here over the next couple of weeks uh, that I'll be doing. So you'll be hearing from a few guests. I really enjoy those. I'm hoping to do a lot more interviews this year. Uh, in the past, we've had, you know, kind of had stints where we'll do some, you know, quite a few interviews and then I'll do a lot of solo shows and then we did some Q and a shows and now we're kind of back on the, the interview thing. And, and I like all that. I really do. It's all, I like the variety of the show. I like doing different things, but we got a few guests lined up here and I really enjoy the, the guests coming on and I get to learn a lot and get to, to hear folks story and their journey into homesteading and gardening. It's always a lot of fun. So if you want to come on the podcast and tell us about your, um, your journey into homesteading and some of the things you've got going on, you're always welcome to do that. There's a if you go to the uh, the podcast page at the website at smalltownhomestead.com, there at the top you'll see a link for uh, uh, to be a guest on the uh, on the podcast and just fill out that form and um, best you can. You know if you don't fill out everything, I'll still contact you. But uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to have you on if you got something that you want to talk about in the homesteading that's homesteading related. And uh, always uh, eager to uh, hear about uh, what folks are what folks are doing on their homestead. So do that if you'd like. Uh, thanks for the uh, reviews in iTunes and in other places, and there on the website even. I always appreciate that. Been getting a lot of visits to the website lately. A lot of a lot of folks checking out the articles and the show notes and the podcast. Really, really appreciate that. So thank you very much for listening. And until next week, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.